So today I'm here with a good friend of mine, um, NFT Supply, to talk about his project, Chex Bitcoin Ordinals Edition. So what fascinates me about what NFT Supply is doing is he was the first person I know um, to really push into the ordinal space, which at least to me is still very confusing. And so um, I would just want to thank him for coming on the show today to really help us not only stand, understand his project, but also to understand ordinals in general, because it, the waters get pretty deep pretty fast when you get into the technical side um, of ordinals. And so he's going to help us navigate that a bit today. So thanks for being here, Supply. Thank you for having me. Okay, so talk to me about your project, because I remember hearing the very early kind of rumblings around ordinals. And then I think in one of our chats, it was like right out of the gate, you were all over it. Um, and so walk me through like, like what is Chex Bitcoin Ordinals Edition? Yeah, so Chex Bitcoin Ordinal Edition is a project that I created uh, with the goal of educating people in the Ethereum community uh, to learn more about Bitcoin and kind of start getting their feet wet uh, with ordinals. Um, many times in the Ethereum world, when you're getting into NFTs, people's first interaction when they get into NFTs is, you know, downloading a MetaMask and they've never, you know, heard of a seed phrase and it's a huge learning curve. Um, so the point of the project was to pretty much help bridge and cross-pollinate Ethereum NFT users over to Ordinals. And the way that I uh, figured would be a cool way to do that was to start educating uh, the Ethereum community. Um, you know, I'm pretty active on Twitter. So I just started writing articles um, and was like, you know what? I'm going to help people get their first ordinal. And the first ordinal that they're going to get is going to be, you know, one that I've created. Um, at the time when the project came out, Jack Butcher's checks were, you know, the talk of the town. Uh, he's obviously done a ton of innovative stuff since then. But Regardless of that, um, I think the uh, the Twitter check verified badge is a very cool piece of art to uh, you know, use. So as a homage to Jack, I uh, created Jack's, uh, Check's Bitcoin edition. And uh, the whole point of that is you know, to kind of join this educational journey while also having some fun with some burn mechanics um, and then eventually some really cool uh, art to own on Bitcoin and display on your wall so you can expand your portfolio from not just being Ethereum based NFTs, but uh, Bitcoin NFTs or ordinals as well. Well, it's really neat. So so you're not only obviously it's art that you can collect and display, but also there's an educational component to it, right? When somebody's just getting started, uh, and really, this is why it's like, all right, supply, educate my dumb ass. All right. So when we talk about ordinals, as somebody um, Let's take, let, I, I'm going to ask this two different ways, almost like, let, can you answer it for somebody that doesn't know what NFTs are in general? And then can you kind of be, give me the, the person coming from um, ETH side of answer? Does that make sense? For sure. For sure. Um, all right. So I guess we'll start with the, if you don't know what an NFT or if you don't collect the theory NFTs, right? So if we're starting from really square one, I think a good place to start is, you know, what's an NFT, right? You know, like, do you understand digital ownership? If not, you know, this is what it is, you know, imagine all the time you spend these days is consuming content and pushing content on your phone, you're sending text messages, you're posting stories on Instagram, you're consuming Instagram, posting tweets, this and that, um, you know, you care much more about what you're doing socially and what other people can see around the world versus, you know, honestly, what's going on in real life, right? You know, your social media is a highlight reel at this point. So I think that once you start understanding that, you know, like the content that you're posting, you can actually own that and, you know, do some really cool things with that because, it, you know, when you have an NFT, there's a lot of uh, mechanics that you can put into owning something digitally. Um, I think that, you know, you kind of have to start from like, you know, explaining what's an NFT. Once you get through that whole point of what an NFT is, and obviously for the sake of this conversation, I'm assuming that people do know what an NFT is. Um, I think you start getting into understanding, you know, what is really an NFT from a technical standpoint on Ethereum, because the difference between NFTs on Bitcoin versus Ethereum are really the technicalities behind the scenes, right? So most of the time on Ethereum, an NFT is a unique token, and that unique token has 
different parameters that you can query upon it, right? So for instance, like a token ID is something you can query. For instance, my board ape is you know, BAYC4676. I can query token ID 4676. One of the other things that I can query is the token URI. So what's a token URI? This is a link to a file that contains all the metadata about my ape, right? So that metadata might be that it has you know, robot glasses, it has a Vietnam helmet, things like that. But the key thing to understand here is that the token itself doesn't hold that metadata. It is a link to that metadata, right? So what's that link to? It's something called IPFS, um, or sometimes, you know, if you're using Manifold, they're big users of Rweave, and those are just decentralized storage systems, right? So at the end of the day, your NFT is nothing more than what's called a JSON file, which is just, you know, the file that holds all the metadata, and it's just a link to that, right? Where things get really interesting on Bitcoin is that ordinals are fully on-chain. So what you're doing on Bitcoin is you're doing what's called inscribing a Satoshi. So there are 100 million Satoshis that make up a Bitcoin. What you're doing is you're taking one individual SAT, SAT is in short for Satoshi, and you are pushing some data. on Which would be the equivalent of like a penny-ish. But if there was 100 million pennies and a dollar, a Satoshi would be a penny to a dollar for the folks paying attention. Exactly, exactly, 100%. The same way if you're looking at Ethereum, uh, if you ever you know, pay gas, you'd see that that's often in times uh, done in GUE. So there's 1 billion GUE in one ETH. Similar, you know, if you want to get really super technical, right? Um, so what's happening is that you're taking a Satoshi and you're pushing data onto it. And you know that's what inscribing is, right? And the data that you're pushing onto it um, caters towards a standard um, that the creator of Ordinals, this guy, Casey Rodimore, uh, created. And that standard includes a few things, some of which include uh, content type. So if you're ever doing something like uploading an image file to the internet, or if you ever you know, are on Google Chrome and you go into inspection mode and take a look at the code behind the scenes, you can see that if you're looking at an image, it says content type image slash JPG or something like that, right? Um, or slash ping. And what you're able to do on an ordinal is you can specify a content type and then you can specify a content. And what that content is, for instance, you know, could be an image, right? Um, so how do you store an image? Well, at the end of the day, you know, if we're getting super technical, everything that we're talking about is all zeros and ones, right? So what happens with an image is that you can take an image file and you can convert that into a long string. And a string is just a set of characters, like a really long word, right? And what you're doing is you're doing what's called base, taking a base 64 string of this image. So, you know, obviously I'm getting a little technical here, but all you need to understand is that you're taking an image, converting it into a long word, and that long word is the content on the NFT, right? And when that long word also has a content type that matches what that content is, a web browser like Google Chrome can render that, or you know, an app like iMessage can render that, things like that, right? Um, and you can so point the back to thing, for verification, pretty much. Exactly. So the unique thing here is that every single ordinal is natively on-chain. It's natively stored on Bitcoin, and Bitcoin is the most secure network and the most decentralized network in the entire world. It's a non-negotiable thing. This is a fact. Way more decentralized and way more secure than IPFS or Rweave. So that's a really cool thing that's going on over here. Um, and I think what's also really cool is that there's a lot of, you know, there hasn't been a lot of uh, movement in terms of innovation on Bitcoin, um, at the very least outside of the Bitcoin Maxi community. And I think what's really interesting here is that now you're having this whole influx of developers, you know, people that have been building on Ethereum coming over to Bitcoin and really starting to, you know, get their feet wet. Bitcoin maximalists are, you know, sometimes upset because they're saying that, you know, you're clogging up the network, you're making fees so high to transact, you know, like look at what you're doing to blocks and things like that. Um, and they're kind of disregarding the fact that, you know, we're at a, when I first started, talking, you know, diving into ordinals, there was probably around, you know, maybe 12, 13,000 inscriptions at that point. And what are we a month or so later? And there's, you know, 800,000 now, yeah. you know, people are, you know, diving in, you know, 
Yeah, it's like insanely early. Um, and again, there's a hundred million of these, you know, sats to go around. So we're like, you know, there's a long way. To, like, just to give you an idea of how early we are right now. Yep. Um, no, this is good. This is good. All right, I'm going to ask you a question. So, okay, I'm going to try to do the Sesame Street version of this with my um, obstacles, the way coin. All right. So let me know what I'm getting right and what I'm getting wrong. All right. So let's say. <laughs> all right. So I have, let's say I have a JPEG of a monkey, okay? Right? And I want to put that, you know, I have this JPEG of a monkey and I want to put that on Ethereum, right? In essence, this could be stored on AWS. This could be stored on it wherever, right? It has to be stored obviously in the cloud somehow. And then this image gets committed to the blockchain, right? So in essence, we know when it was made, you have provenance, you could tell who owns it, all that kind of good stuff. It's committed to the blockchain forever. Make sense? Well, not necessarily, right? So like what's happening here is that that image can change, you know, like that you've seen projects where the metadata does change. Yep, that's right. So you can update it, but you can still see it's an unbroken chain back to the original. For sure, for sure, for right. sure. Okay, now here's what I'm trying to understand. So what's interesting to me about ordinals, if I'm understanding it right, is like now you can, ins instead of, ins I guess, in putting it directly on the blockchain, it's actually being inscri inscribed to Satoshi's, correct? Yes. Right? And so what's interesting to me about that is not only, let's say, the JPEG of the monkey becomes more valuable because, in essence, the IP goes up, the club becomes more valuable, you name it. Because you're inscribing to an actual Satoshi, What's interesting about this to me is if these Satoshis right now, because what's a Bitcoin right now ish? 22, what, 23, like 28,000, yeah. 28 grand, right? So if someday a Bitcoin is a million dollars, not only let's say your project goes up in value, right? But also the actual Satoshi that you're committing it to has also gone up in value because it doesn't just destroy the, it doesn't burn it like gas, correct? That, that's correct. That's like one of the memes that is in industry when you know when you talk about you're joking around about uh you know projects rugging, you know an ordinal can never go to zero, you know because, because technically you have your Satoshi. Kind of, you know, so correct. literally, this is being, um, this is being committed, like added to the Satoshi, almost like if somebody took a stamp. And that's exactly it. that's a that's a fantastic way of describing it as a as if you you know stamp something. What's funny about it, there's an old story, and it's actually what the reason why our coins are protected is there's this one of the old school advertisers in France, um, long, long time ago, he had a soap company. And he was like, I'm trying to get the word out about my soap company. And so he was like, how do I get this in everybody's hands? And he was looking at his coins. And he was like, wait a second. And he was stamping the name of the soap company onto coins and circulating them in Europe. And then people are like, whoa, you can't just like, Change, imagine if it said Dove soap across your like every coin in your pocket. And it's why all of a sudden now the reason why we have all these rules about protecting money is it actually started there. So instead of it being stamped with like Dove, it's stamped with, okay, the JPEG of the monkey is now committed to this coin. So not only, uh, not only could the JPEG go up in value because of a number of reasons, but also there's always going to be some sort of value associated with Satoshis. And if you believe in the Bitcoin ecosystem, you're going to, not only is this going to go up, or even if this doesn't go up, like you said, it can never go to zero because like, let's say eventually a Satoshi is worth a dollar. At the very least, your ordinal will always be worth a dollar. Correct? That's correct. Great. That's okay. Correct. I was just doing the Sesame Street version of this to make sure people like myself are getting this, getting this right. For sure. And also like to get a little technical, one other thing that you can do is you can inscribe a Satoshi more than once. So oh, we've in, so within this whole ordinal world, um, there's, you know, obviously a standard that everyone's agreed to. And that standard is that the Genesis inscription on a Satoshi is considered the NFT, hmm. right? So if you have a Satoshi that has no inscriptions on it, the first inscription is the ordinal, right? That, or rather that's the NFT. That's what we're considering is valuable. I could inscribe that Satoshi again, and there could be a subsequent, right? So it starts at, you know, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven in terms of inscriptions. 
It's just that none of the wallet providers or marketplaces will consider that valid because you're only looking for the first inscription in an array. Got you, but it's possible. So let me ask you this. This was actually a big deal when Moonbirds did this, where they went in chain instead of on chain, where in essence, you know, the original CryptoPunks, right, going back to Ethereum, were actually on are actually on the blockchain. It's why the files were so small. Like sometimes people look at it and go like, oh, it's this kind of 8-bit thing. It's like, well, yeah, because what they wanted to do was instead of it have pinging a hard drive some, you know, somewhere in the cloud, wherever, uh, AWS, wherever it was pinging, like wherever our apes are, right? Um, um, they wanted it actually on the blockchain forever. So CryptoPunks are a big deal because they were actually is inscribed, committed. What would be the right way to say that? That's a good question. What is the phrase that you would use for like deploying something, I mean, deploying on chain? Yeah. Okay. So they were deployed. So they were actually, they're, they're like, not physically, but they're actually on chain as opposed to pinging a, pinging a server. Make sense? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because I could put like a music video on chain, but it's stored here and it's actually pinging the server. And I'm sorry, server is pinging the blockchain. So you can prove provenance. Whereas now you could actually store a music video in an ordinal on a Satoshi. That's right. You're limited to the size of a block, right? So the size of a block is a max of four megabytes. Yep. Um, so also so, okay, that's right. So that's kind of what I wanted to get at is sure. so now that now that we're again, if you're on Ethereum, um a lot most almost all of them are stored uh, obviously off chain, right? Um Moonbirds now you can go on chain, stuff like that. Right. But you're pretty much using the blockchain as as validation that, yes, this is owned by NFT supply. He bought it on this date, blah, blah, blah. With ordinals, you're saying this is actually being the file itself. So like this actual JPEG is being actually inscribed to this. So it's not it's not it's not sourcing some other database. You're in essence, if this is three megs, well, let's say this is a two meg image, which I know it's not, but let's say it was that's being added to the actual Satoshi, correct? That's correct. Which means the more of these these add, like the larger and larger the database becomes. That's correct. So so with that when in you, mind... When you, and when you say database, it's more so like, I guess it's a database of content, right? Like it's always just on the Bitcoin network, right? That's you right. Can query so, but the it, network right? gets bigger, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and I mean, there's more data on it. Yep. There's more data on it. And so that's one of the, I guess, things that, you know, originally a lot of people view Bitcoin as it's supposed to be global neutral money. Right. And then they see artists like yourself and others going, hey, we can also there's more that we can do with Bitcoin. Um, and they're saying, why would you want to add that those two megs, whatever, you know, whatever, 200 kilobytes or whatever it actually is. Why would you want to add that to the network? Because it just makes, in essence, it harder to download and harder for people to run nodes and stuff like that. From an artist perspective, how would you counter that argument? You know, I think it's like one of those things where when you first, you know, I've been trading, collecting uh, NFTs on Ethereum, not since CryptoPunks, but since, you know, starting, I guess, end of 2020, beginning of 2021. And when we first started minting things on Ethereum, there were gas wars. And obviously it was a big problem, but it was kind of like a cost of doing business. Um, and I kind of assimilate, you know, doing, you know, the Bitcoin network being more clogged and maybe transactions costing more to be done and maybe, you know, amount of blocks and data you need to download to start up a node might be more but you know innovation is happening right now nothing is perfect you know at you know gen zero and you know it'll always get better you know you've seen on ethereum contracts now optimized for gas and there are things that are done you know zuki kind of pioneered this with the erc 721a where you know they're much more gas efficient code for minting nfts now and i think that you know, in time, you know, as you are cross pollinating, as you are bringing more developers into the Bitcoin ecosystem, naturally, you know, more innovation will happen on that side of things. And perhaps, you know, we'll be able to store way larger files, you know, in a way more compressed format. Now, I mean, Yuga, for instance, 
uh, stored their ordinals with a web uh, P file, because that's super small. I think the gods did that too. Um, but, you know, for instance, that's way smaller than a ping. So already there, you're helping. Um, but, you know, I think that in time, you know, as more innovation happens, you know, it'll get better. But I don't think that because you have a short term issue, you should. But I mean, listen, if you're a Bitcoin maxi at this point, you're in this for the long haul. And I think you need to share that mindset when it comes to not just sound money, but when it comes to any sort of innovation on a network period. Yep. And honestly, the cool thing, too, is it is getting more attention, right? And like you said, there's new devs coming over, which will help the network. There's more artists coming over and going like, hey, what can I do with this? Which yep. hopefully will get more eyeballs on the ecosystem as a whole. Um, and so it's the there's usually not a lot of uh, fun, exciting news around the Bitcoin network. It's every few years like lightning or some taproot or whatever. Right. And so um, I think this is a it's it's a. It's cool that their people are finding new and innovative. Like you said, Casey really figured out like, okay, we can do some new and innovative things and see kind of how this morphs and grows. So, so and kind of get and he got a lot of shit for it too. Yeah, I bet he did. He got it, a ton. It's weird to have a community that's that's so innovative around some things and then and then not in other things, which is kind of an interesting thing, right? Um, so. Let's let's get back to the actual. OK, so you walked me through kind of, OK, here's why ordinals are different. Right. Um, you know, it's not just the blockchain. They're actually being inscribed to the actual sats. The early, early days you were I mean, you were probably around for this. I wasn't um, in the Ethereum ecosystem. I've heard nothing but like when you listen to stories from like Larva Labs talking about CryptoPunks back in the day and how they were a really a pain in the ass to get. Right. Um, walk me through kind of the history of that and why we're kind of seeing something similar. So in in the early days, why was it so hard to actually go and get a crypto punk when they were like giving them away damn near? Right. Well, I guess, unfortunately, I was I was fully using Ethereum at that point. I wasn't unfortunately claiming crypto punks. I really wish I was. Um, but at the time, you know, MetaMask was like in its earliest of early days, like the UI UX for getting these was just not what it is now. Um, and that's very much the same. Well, not so much anymore, honestly, on Bitcoin ordinals. Like in a month, we've seen a tremendous amount of innovation when it comes to uh, wallets and minting okay, services. Okay, that's huge because my understanding was, at least what I was hearing was, yeah, I mean, you have to do, it's nothing but trust trades. The wallets are a disaster. So where, it was. where's it at now? Like if I, in essence, what I mean for that is for folks paying attention is cool. So I want to get one. How do I actually custody the asset? Well, you need a wallet. Well, it's easy to custody assets on Ethereum, Solana, et cetera. But really up until, gosh, the last two months, there was no reason to custody. There were no ordinals. So all of a sudden you have to stand up an entire ecosystem of wallets so that you can even like hold it. So how, what's yeah, kind of the yeah. state of things right now from just a custody perspective? I mean, now we're at a point where, you know, your wallet is as easy as installing a MetaMask. You know, there are essentially, for the lack of better, you know, analogy, there are MetaMasks for uh, Bitcoin now. There's a bunch of popular ones, some that are open source, that are some that are closed source. Some open source ones are Unisat, which is a really popular Chrome extension. And obviously, you know, the Bitcoin maximalist community, um, which is, you know, all pro open source. Um, I feel like even most people on Ethereum are pretty pro open source at this point, too. Um, just because, you know, when you build collectively in the public, you know, it's just things go better and innovate quicker. And, you know, you can actually you know, audit code and things like that. Um, there's another really popular one with a really slick UI called Xverse, which is closed source. Um, but when this first started, you know, there was... You know, you were going into Discord. You had to be invited in sometimes or just join it randomly. They would have a website with the NFTs and you would pick and choose which one to right click save to your computer. You would then either use in the early days, there was this thing called an ordinals bot. I believe it's up and running again now, but when people first started getting in, it shut down because it got overloaded real quick. But hmm. you'd have to run your own Bitcoin node essentially. And then inscribe it yourself with the ordinal CLI tool that Casey created. And to run a Bitcoin node, 
you know, sometimes takes a few days to sync up, you know, it's a shit ton of data. Um, so it's also kind of technical, you know, it's not just like, you know, download and install. It's like download, install, sync, run a few commands. And if you're not a programmer running your know, command for the first time, you feel like a hacker, you know, you don't really know what you're doing. Um, so barrier to entry is pretty large. Um, what is cool is how they were able to verify, you know, which was part of a collection, like kind of prove provenance. And that's by, you know, encoding different unique things within the bitmap data of the image. So you're able to verify like as long, and that's the thing too, right? That bitmap, that bitmap data gets screwed up if you downsize the image, for instance. Hmm. So you need to download the one specifically, for instance, like Bitcoin punks did this. You had to download the Bitcoin punk, you had to then inscribe it yourself. And if you were the first person to inscribe it, that was yours. Wow. Like for instance, I got beyond that one. I inscribed a Bitcoin punk. Someone's transaction went through before mine. So I have a, I have inscription number like 38,000 something, and it's a Bitcoin punk. But if you go to the Bitcoin punk collection, it's not part of the collection because mine was the second. Oh, wow. Uh, so it was almost like a land grab. It's essentially what it was. Um, so, uh, that's what it was like in the early days. And if you wanted to trade, it was like OTC discord, you know, like this person will be the middleman. What do you mean by OTC? Just for folks like over, over, over the counter trading. Yeah. Just between like, Hey, I'll trust you. You send me the Bitcoin and I'll exactly. send you. Yeah, exactly. And then you'll send me the, uh, the ordinal. Um, and yeah, it was a complete mess, but now there's been, so there isn't, I wouldn't say old, but a relatively recent innovation within uh, Bitcoin called PSBTs, which are uh, an acronym for partially signed Bitcoin transactions. And that is kind of like the new norm for in a trustless manner, buying, selling, trading. Oh, so it almost like halfway, it's almost like a mediator. Kind of. So yeah, what happens here is like on Ethereum, traditionally what happens is, is that you have a smart contract, which is facilitating this trade of, you know, one asset for another. Um, what's happening here is that you're taking your ordinal and you're signing half of it with your wallet's signature. And then what you're doing is you're taking that hash, which is what, you know, you get spat out. And then you send it to someone else and they sign the other half of it and instantaneously the swap happens. Oh, that's cool. So it's a trustless system still. Yeah. Even more trustless than a smart contract, you know, which is like really crazy. Now is the UX for that, you know, the most optimal thing right now for, you know, a, you know, everyday non-technical person? No. Um, but that'll change yep. in time. Um, but at least from a technical standpoint, you know, functionality wise, you can do it. Um, so that's the newest innovation right now. Um, there are marketplaces that allow you to, you know, upload your PSBTs and allow people and allow you to like specify a price. And then you can just leave it there and people can just, you know, sign the other half and it just happens automatically. Wow. Um, a super popular one right now is called open Ordex for that. But then there are many other platforms that are rolling this out uh, now too. So um, part of this whole, you know, checks Bitcoin ordinal edition project is uh, I've written articles about all this stuff, right? So I wrote a article called Bitcoin ordinals for dummies, which kind of gives you a little breakdown of what we're doing right now, but in text um, with some diagrams that I put together as well to kind of help illustrate things. Um, there is an ordinal wallet uh, article as well, which is kind of like a running list of popular wallets. And I kind of show you which ones are open source, closed source, how to connect ordinals to your ledger, things like that. Um, and then there's also an ordinals marketplace one, as well as what the fuck is a PSBT. So <laughs> uh -huh. for anyone watching this, feel free to head over to my mirror profile and check those out, or just head to my Twitter, it's pinned there. Um, and feel free to read through those because obviously I'm giving out a lot right now and it's a lot to absorb all at once. No, oh, that's great. So, so let me ask you this, like we've talked about kind of the, the technology behind it, the fact that you can actually inscribe ordinals to Satoshis um, so that there's always going to be some sort of value there on top of the value of the actual asset, which is really interesting. The wallet stuff, I mean, even when you and I were hanging out a few weeks ago, it sounds like the difference between the last three weeks in this space <laughs> from the standpoint of wallets and markets has been massive, right? 
so um so i guess we'll kind of end with this of like when you're looking at this ecosystem and obviously you're building a project in here and like i said you were the first person i know uh that was building in this ecosystem like you were super early on all of this are you bullish? Are you still bullish on ordinals? Like when you look at it in the kind of, if you were to look in your crystal ball, um, why are you excited about it? Or are you more excited now before you like, since you've launched and gotten in deeper, are you excited, more excited now? Or are you seeing kind of cracks in the pavement and going, I don't know. I think it's always gonna, you know, I don't really see like a future here. What do you, what are you seeing? Yeah, that's a really good question. Well, I, I think two things. I think that one, you know, me naturally as like a human in this space, you know, this is very much an attention economy. And I think that while I might be bullish on something right now, there are times where, you know, you just naturally get distracted because there are new things that just pop up that catch your interest or catch your eye, right? Um, so I would say that I was, you know, knee deep in ordinals for, you know, probably like a month and a half or so. Um, IRL life came at me and, you know, I took a week off. And when I took that week off, you know, I came back and I was like, wait, what? I feel like a newbie again. Um, and I feel like, you know, I have, I, I don't even, I don't know anything anymore, you know? Um, but I would say that in general, when it comes to being bullish on ordinals, I think it's a much bigger question, which is, are you bullish on Bitcoin? Because ordinals will continue to grow. Digital ownership isn't going anywhere. I think we've already proven that on Ethereum. Um, so I think that if your bet here is that if Bitcoin is going to become, you know, this world currency one day, or like the most, you know, continue to be the, the most decentralized and secure and most sound money that the world has ever seen. If you're still bullish on that, then I think naturally you still are bullish on ordinals. If you're bullish on digital ownership too, I happen to be bullish on both. Yep. So in short, yes, I'm still bullish on it. I think that just like Ethereum NFTs, is every ordinal going to be worth something? I mean, I guess technically, no, they'll never be worth zero, right? Because they're on a sat, but like others will perform better than others. Just like any art market. Yep. Correct. And I think that when it comes down to it, that's just a sign of, you know, who has better communities, right? Who has a better collector base. And that doesn't change from Ethereum to Bitcoin. Um, so if you've asked me, are there specific Bitcoin ordinal projects that I'm bullish on right now? I think that's a tough thing to answer, given how early we are. Um, there are some really popular ones and some people that are doing some interesting things. For instance, you know, one person that I talk to, you know, relatively often is uh, a super rare artist named Billy Reste, and he has his ordinal shards project. And he actually gave me the inspiration to kind of do checks Bitcoin edition as a ETH mint pass, so to speak, that then bridges over to Bitcoin. Um, he took the mindset of inscribing everything super early. Um, so I think that he started as early as like 8,000 inscriptions or something. And he already, you know, pre-inscribed his ordinals and, you know, would let you, you know, redeem them. Um, so we're doing this a little differently there, but what he's doing is pretty interesting. And it's like legit 3D art, right? This is like, wow. he's a super rare artist, you know, he's yeah. a, a comic artist. Another project in terms of a community that I... Uh, have sort of been paying attention to is uh, a Solana project called Catalina Whales. Um, they've done some pretty cool pixel art um, for what they've created called Nakamoto Whales. And what they're doing, what's really interesting is that some of their one of ones are being inscribed on uncommon sats. Mm. Um, something that if you are a collector of Czechs Bitcoin edition, there is something in the works for you know, them as well with some one of ones that are we are working on. Um, and if you want, you can show a little bit of a preview of those that might give you a nice little sneak. Yeah. Um, but what's neat about those is that when you're inscribing an ordinal or rather inscribing a Satoshi, there are rarities naturally uh, in those Satoshis, right? So imagine you're inscribing something on a Satoshi that Satoshi Nakamoto sent to Hal Finney hmm. and then Hal Finney sent to someone else. The provenance on that is yeah. <clears throat> absurd, you know, right? It's really, really difficult to find those. Um, right now, you can generally find an uncommon sat or two every, if you tr move and trade 25 Bitcoin at a time, you can kind of find it relatively quickly. 
Um, but obviously that's a ton of Bitcoin to be moving around regularly to find an uncommon sat. And then there's rare sats and things like that. But the cattle, or rather the Nakamoto whales are doing some inscriptions on uncommon sats, which I think is really neat um, from a collector's standpoint. Okay, so let me break that down for folks that aren't geeks like us. So like, imagine you actually had a coin that George Washington created, right? So Satoshi started Bitcoin, right? George Washington, our first president. So imagine if somebody found a coin that he personally minted and gave to, I don't know, the King of France, right? You're saying you can now find that coin and inscribe that with maybe like a special plaque or something that like, you know, so you can, it, there's a lot of people, coin collectors, that if that existed, oh, that was the coin that George Washington gave to the King of France, people, people would find that desirable. It's the same type of a thing. That is exactly correct. Yeah. What's also really exciting to me about ordinals in general is that remember technically all you're defining is a content and a content type and some people have been doing some really 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 cool things um, as a result of that for instance a content type could be a javascript file and you could store the contents of that javascript file in a satoshi and if you render that javascript file on google chrome for instance you could have on-chain games. Oh, that's cool. Like Pac-Man, for instance. So people are doing like really, really neat things like that. Um, so I think that's what's really interesting about Bitcoin as well. Hmm. Um, and that's what some of the things that I've been paying attention to. That's really crazy. I mean, imagine just like the fact that you could actually take something of value like, like a token, like a Satoshi, and put a game on it. And then you go, okay, well, you have the baseline value plus it's the first video game ever inscribed to a Satoshi. What's the value of that? It just, it's a, it's a lot of fun. Like this stuff is so interesting, the emerging technology stuff like this, because you, you can just human ingenuity and like creativity and what's going to happen over the next 10 years is going to be absolutely mind blowing. It's going to be insane. So let's uh we always like to end with just just really kind of like the pitch right so checks bitcoin ordinals edition why 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 collect like you tell me like what who's it for so the reason why you want to collect uh checks bitcoin ordinal edition is because if you are someone on ethereum that wants to get their feet dirty their hands wet on bitcoin and collect your first ordinal Checks Bitcoin edition will allow you to go down this rabbit hole, learn more about them, uh, become, you know, an expert slowly but surely. You know, we're always continuously learning, but you'll be able to learn more about ordinals and collect one at the same time. Uh, and what's also really cool is some of the mechanics that I have coming out for it and some of the one of one art for full set holders specifically, um, because at the end of the day, you know, this isn't just an educational project. I want you to own an ordinal that you're proud to own and have in your wallet, right? I want the same way that Ethereum NFTs, we see a lot of token frames and displays coming onto the market to display your NFTs. I want you to be proud to display your ordinal. So I obviously love the art for the Czechs Bitcoin edition, the Taproot edition, and the Lightning edition. And obviously those are homages to, you know, innovations in the Bitcoin network for instance, the Taproot upgrade, which enables ordinals and Lightning network, which allows for Bitcoin transactions to really, you know, work at scale. Um, but I want you to own really cool one-of-one -one art that you would display on your wall. Um, so yeah, if you want to get involved in a dope project. That's why you collect checks Bitcoin ordinal edition. Well, it's awesome that the fact that it's, it's educational, but, you also get to collect and have the upside too, which is really great. Cause, uh, cause like I said, you're not only one of the earliest projects I've seen in the space, but also I think it's awesome that the whole foundation of the project is making a path for new people to just understand the ecosystem. Because one of the things we always talk about on Alfie is, you know, the goal is to bring transparency and education to the ecosystem. So less people are taken advantage of. And I think that you're doing the, you're doing exactly that. So thanks for coming on supply. Really appreciate your time and um, love the project. Super dope. Thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it.